So good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for being here in such an early time in the day, and thank you all the GitConf, uh, CommitConf, sorry, uh, all the volunteers and the organizers for, you know, dedicating their time to provide us with this beautiful talk. Uh, my name is uh, Salvador Perez. I, sorry, sorry. Yeah, spelled S A W A N E by Starbucks employees all over the world, which is not exactly the the actual, anyway. Uh, so, yeah, I'm currently working at 20 as a backend engineer, and meanwhile, I'm just uh, studying some functional programming to try to sneak some of the features there. Let's see how that goes. And, well, the important part of this slide is that we are hiring. So, yeah, if you, any of you want to join us, just go just outside the, the, the talk and left hand side we have a stand so you will be able to provide your data and we'll contact you. Uh, this talk is about Git internals and this is the agenda we will, we will have today. First I will do uh, just a brief, very, very brief introduction. I will ask you a couple of questions to warm up the, the audience. And uh, I've uh, split the, the talk in three parts. For the first one, I will talk about the low-level uh, data structures that Git manages. After that, I will provide just a bit of uh, data on some extra, I won't call them data structures, but some extra data Git manages. And after that, I will talk about all the high-level commands you can use and how they relate to those uh, data structures, if time allows it, which, well, we'll see about that. Uh, for the introduction, uh, how many of you are using Git in your current work or have you used in, in the past? Okay, yeah, most of you. And uh, from all of you that are using it, how many of you did have to clone uh, a repository again after messing up? Ever? Cool. <laughs> so anyway, uh, Git was built with kind of the Unix philosophy in mind not because of the, the Git, Git itself, the Git CLI itself, but because of the, all the subcommands it contains. So there are lots of very, very low level that only do one thing and they do it well. And then there are lots of abstractions which use the, the low level ones. The first ones are called the plumbing commands and the uh, second ones are uh, the porcelain commands. And that's all for the introduction. Uh, this is the directory that you get once you create a new repository or clone one. Uh, it will create a .git folder directory and inside that you will have this structure here. The branches one is, as far as I know, deprecated and uh, it's only there for purpose of uh, backward compatibility. Uh, hooks and info are important but not, I will not delve into those. And finally, these three here, I will talk about them, both logs, refs, and objects, but I will focus more on these two. Uh, yeah, I decided to uh, name this part of the, of the talk, just Git as a version file system, because it kind of is what actually happens behind the scenes in, in Git. Git manages three, kind of, three kinds of objects, the blobs, trees, and commits. For the blobs, it is a representation on, on one file at one given point in time. It will contain the whole content of the file, uh, compressed, so it will be really small because it's usually text. And the name of the, of the file is uh, the SHA1 of the content. It, I think it has some more details about that. It contains something about the name for salting and everything, but Basically, it's the, the hash of the, of the content. Uh, notice that the blobs don't contain any information about the name of the file. It's only the content. It's a dump object, just a dumping ground for the, for the object content. So I won't talk much more about, about blobs. Here, I left you a couple of uh, plumbing commands, the low-level ones, in case you want to delve a bit deeper and uh, just play a bit with it. These are, well, the ones used to get one file and generate the, the blob object, and the ones to retrieve one. 
so you can play with those and uh, we will go yeah we will go into trees uh, when I talk about tree and the tree structure that git uses I'm talking about one node of a tree so it recursively uses several trees to to get the whole directory um, it has a very tight structure uh, internal structure because it, uh, this one is not compressed it only contains data and contains yeah pointers to blobs and trees uh, yeah this is a screenshot for one actual uh, tree in one of my uh, repositories as you see it contains in the first column the unix uh, permission tuple with some extra data which is used to identify the the type of object there even when you have the, the, the actual type there. You have here the signature, so the SHA1, with which the object is named after. And finally, here is where uh, Git stores the name of each file and directory, so it can retrieve it later. That's all the recent trees, so when you want to get uh, uh, your whole directory back at one point in time, it will get the top level directory, the top level tree, and recursively all over the different trees, it will get the data back. Commits. Commits do uh, have the um, a very tight uh, representation as well because it contains as well data that Git needs to understand and parse. Uh, I think we will see better what it contains in the, in the example here. It starts with a tree, so the representation, the hash of the, of the tree and the parent commit. So you could say the whole git uh, repository is just a graph and it, in each node of the graph you contain a tree with the whole version you had at that point in time. Because that's what commits are. They are a, a, s a snapshot of your whole director of your whole repository in a given point in time. After that you have two lines that at first seem to be actually the same. So the author and the committer but there's a very slight difference. The author is the one who actually wrote the changes in, uh, in reflected in that commit. The committer is the one who actually committed them, which is usually the same, but not always. So for instance, when you do a cherry pick, you basically are copying the diff from you, you introduced in one commit into another. If you do a cherry pick of your own commit, yeah, that's no problem. Both will be still the same. But if you cherry pick a commit from a different user, yeah, the author will keep track of who was the original committer of those, of those changes. And the committer line will uh, contain info on who did that actual commit. So you don't keep uh, traceability on that. Finally, in these lines, you have the um, timestamp on when was that commit created. So that's how uh, several tools uh, let you know how many time ago it was created. That's that's how. And finally, well, you have the the git message for the to identify what happened in the, in that without lo actually looking at the changes it themselves. So yeah, that's basically all there's about commits. And yeah, I kind of uh, lied a bit. Uh, there's one fourth data structure here, not only blobs, trees, and, and commits. We have the index. The index is kind of, I like to see it as a dumping ground for everything. So it contains a lot of information on uh, optimizations. It contains a lot of info on what, for instance, what files you did add and they are pending to commit. So all that information is here. It has, uh, for what, I can, what I've been able to find, uh, it, contain, it doesn't have a very uh, thorough and in-depth in depth, uh, documentation on the structure. I found these two links, which you can check in the, in the slides, because I added the, the link to the, to, to the slides to the uh, talk description, and I will tweet them as well, so you can, you can just delve deeper as well. And uh, again, I've left you a couple of plumbing commands in case you want to play a, a bit more. But yeah, as I told you, each blob contains the whole contents of a file in a given point in time. 
and trees references those blobs and commits references those trees and to do a checkout you don't need a network to get those files back right so do you keep the whole history of all blobs you have created so every time you do a git add of a file you're creating the blobs for that for those files so if even if you uh, add a file by mistake and you revert it back and you make some more changes and you add it again, you will have two blobs. Are you keeping those? Yes. Yes, you are. Except for some optimizations Git does, which, well, I will talk about them in more in depth later, but I can give a, a sneak peek on, on those. So for big files that don't change often, let's think about, um, I don't know, uh, let's assume someone by mistake did add a SQLite database there for testing data and uh, that database only changes once every month, two months because of, I don't know, uh, a change in the schema for instance or some extra test cases you need to add to the database. So in those cases Git will be able to uh, recognize these files are a waste of space so it will create some uh, structure in which it will hold the last version of the file and deltas to the previous ones. So, well, Git is assuming you will uh, want to use the most recent one uh, more often than the, than the old ones, so it's on that way. And, of course, you only see one slice at a time. You will only see one version of each file uh, at a given point in time. Uh, I will only go uh, very quick on this. It's not actually an issue, and I, uh, that's obviously marked as a one fix, but this can give you a really uh, big headache when debugging it. We have seen it only once in, in 20. Uh, it was a couple of months ago, I think. And uh, yeah, so it's what happens when uh, two objects you have created, even uh, a tree and a blob, a blob and a blob, commit and blob, whatever, have the same signature because SHA did collide. And uh, there are some funny cases, depending on which object did uh, collide with which one. Uh, I left here uh, a link uh, where one guy did uh, recompile his SHA1 library to, pro to generate a really, really small hash and just by brute forcing it, pro uh, generating uh, collisions. And it's really funny. To, to read, so I left it there. But the scary thing is, yeah, this one, that some of the failures are silent and you will only detect them when another person uh, clones or pulls and everything will be a mess. Following from that, I will go into the second part, the building up. Uh, I will talk here about branches, uh, tags, and logs. Logs are not so uh, well known, but Branches are tags, I guess, are. Uh, for that part, uh, the, the branches and tags are stored here. So refs heads is branches, and refs tags is, is tags. And finally, uh, the logs contain everything about logs, obviously. Uh, talking about branches, uh, at its core, branches are nothing more than one file containing the hash of one commit. That's all there is to branches with one catch. If you are uh, checked out, we'll see what that means in a very b brief moment. Uh, if you are checked out into a branch and you create a new commit, the branch will move along, which is a behavior you have already seen, so I didn't, um, I didn't discover you, America, but there it is. And this is why uh, Git knows when you are checked out into a branch or why not, or, or when, when not. The head. It's a file uh, contained in the .git directory, just in the plain .git, not inside any subdirectory, sub and it contains a symbolical reference to uh, the, the last branch you have checked out. So that way, uh, if you checked out master, this will contain master, just the plain word. It's a symbolical reference. It doesn't resolve the, the actual commit. So that's the way Git knows okay, I have to move the reference master a bit uh, further when you do a new commit. 
but it doesn't always contain a symbolical reference because you can check out uh, single commits. So when you check out a commit, this will contain the most symbolical reference it can get, which is the actual uh, SHA one, which is not exactly a, a symbolical reference anyway. Uh, while going through these slides this morning, I did think, and I've never tried it before, so I give it to you as homework, and I will do it as, as well myself. Uh, what if you have a branch with the same name as one SHA1 from, from a commit, and you check out that commit, it will probably move the, the branch, but yeah, let's, let's see about that. <laughs> uh, so yeah, when it doesn't, it, contain, it does contain the, the, um, the commit, the commit hash, yeah. After that, yeah, I will go outside, I will skip tags for a moment and talk about logs. Logs is a really, really unknown and really, really useful feature in, in Git. And it's because it contains everything that has happened in uh, your repository. Whenever you pull, whenever you fetch, whenever you merge something, whenever you do even a Git add on a file, this is logged here. And if you realize from the, uh, the structure, this ref's heads uh, kind of resembles to these ref heads here and the ref's remote origin uh, references this ref's remote origin here. So exactly, it will split the logs depending on which branch you are checked out at a given point in time. So uh, if you mess up again with your repository, you can come here and see, okay, what did I do that went wrong? And you will see everything. So you can fix it, which is great. You don't have to pull uh, to clone all over again, which is, which is really, really good. And on top of that, uh, Git uses these logs to provide you some extra functionality. I will, if I have time, I will show you uh, nearly the end. After that, yeah, now we have completed our detour for logs. I, I said I was going to go only briefly over them. And I will move to tags, which is not a very exciting uh, topic anyway. Tags are like branches but they don't move. That's all there is to branches, well, with a couple of catches anyway. There are two types of, of tags. The, co the ones called uh, the lightweight tags, in which, yeah, it's only a file containing uh, a, an object uh, SHA1. And notice I didn't say a commit SHA1. You can do tags on, uh, on blobs. You can do tags on trees. Uh, you can do a lot of black magic with that. So, for instance, you can have some objects committed into Git, because if you have a tag pointing to it, uh, Git will upload those objects, but you don't have them in any working directory, so uh, debugging scripts you don't want in the final version of the, of the program, you can have them apart, and you can just get them out with uh, pulling out the tag, or whatever actually you, you want to think about. After that, uh, the annotated ones. Annotated tags are resemble more uh, to commits. So uh, the annotated tags contain kind of the same structure as, as a commit. It contains the author, it contains uh, the timestamp, it contains a commit message, which is why they are called annotated, because they have the, the message on what you are pointing to, which kind of helps if you're not pointing to a commit, right? Uh, and yeah, the object type and uh, a reference, obviously, to the object. Uh, now I'll move to uh, the remotes part of it, in which, well, a remote, uh, we know that Git is al uh, always uh, defined as a distributed version control system. So what does this mean? This means that there's not a central repository where it doesn't have to, ha it doesn't have to have a central repository from where you pull all the changes and you push all the changes and there's nothing more on the sides. So let's take as an example Heroku, the deployment platform. Uh, to be able to deploy uh, into Heroku, you just need to make a push onto the Heroku uh, remote. So in, the, in that case, you would want to have two remotes. You can have origin, which will point to GitHub, Bitbucket, whatever you like, and you push there your, your code. And then after that, once you want to deploy, you just push to the Heroku remote. And you can, in a 
very weird uh, scenario. You can even have a remote pointing to a, a peer uh, repository, and it should work. I, I don't have any case in mind why you would want to do that, but yeah, you can. Uh, so yeah, the remotes uh, are configured in the .git slash config, and they are configured like this. For each remote, you will have the URL of where the, the, the whole repo is being uh, kept, and then a bunch of uh, ref specs. By default, it will only create one. The, I think it's the first one. Well, with an asterisk here anyway, not, not only master, and an asterisk here, not only master. But this basically uh, tries to represent the fact that whatever you find in your uh, remote origin, the, the, uh, the remote you called origin, ma uh, the reference master will be pulled into your dev master. So in your local, the branch will not be called master, but it will be called dev slash master. So you can do a lot of things uh, there. The one by default substitutes the dev master by an asterisk only. And uh, if you have the, only the fetch one, the fetch and the push will be uh, symmetrical. Tag here, which will say, okay, but when I push master, I will push to dev master. For instance, this is a very, very silly example, and this is not from a real repo. I did just make this up for, for the purpose of the, of the talk, but anyway. Also, you may have noticed I have a plus here, and I don't have a plus here. That's a very subtle difference, and uh, what that means in, in Git terminology is that with, in the ones with the plus, you are allowing it to pull from that remote into that branch, even if the changes are not fast forwarding. So even if you have to actually merge and solve conflicts, it will pull and it will merge into your local branch. If you don't have the plus, it will not. It will say, oh, this is not a fast forward, I'm not going into there. So that's something you may find useful to, to be able to avoid those or losing changes or having merge conflicts when you didn't want to just by pulling. So that's, that's a very useful thing here. And anyway, we are moving finally into the optimizations Git does. I will only talk about a couple of them. So the one that is not in the slides is about uh, the objects directory. So I told you, every tree, every object, every commit you have ever, they are dumped into the, the uh, object directory. That means that once you have a repo, I don't know, with commits for over five years, you will have really huge amount of, of uh, files there. So once Git notices, oh, this is really big, and uh, searching for a given uh, reference in one of those directories with a lot of files will be really expensive. So it will just make an optimization and what it will effectively do is take in all the, all the uh, hashes, take out the two first characters, and create a directory with that name, only the first two characters, and then moving the whole object inside, removing the first two characters. So effectively, the, the, look, the lookup will be exactly the same, but you will be narrowing the search uh, bit by bit. And if one of those folders, directories, already contains a huge lot of objects as well, it will apply that again and create more subdirectories with two characters and move the blobs inside. So searching will be much, much faster. Then moving on to packed refs. Uh, references, uh, that's where the name comes from, are, as I told you, uh, branches and tags. That's all there's to, well, and remotes, the remote branches anyway. Um, once a Git notices Oh, you have lots of references that you are never changing. Uh, you have tags made in 2005 and we are in 2018 and it's, it's pointing to the same object. So there's no point in keeping that in its, in, in its uh, own file because, again, it slows down the search. It will do the same for, uh, for branches. So what Git will effectively do is creating a file called pack, uh, packref which will be in the .git directory, and it contains uh, a list of uh, hashes 
for uh, yeah hashes of the point the object the branch is referencing the branch or the tag and the name of the tag and it will be ordered by the name of the tag so it will be much much easier to look for one of the references and pull the the reference back the the hash and uh, finally the pack refs uh, sorry the pack files this is what I told you about before uh, the ones containing the last snapshot of an object and deltas to the previous ones git will do this automatically every time you push if I recall correctly and uh, every time you do a git gc so for the ones of you that don't know what gc is when you run git gc uh, git will uh, just sweep over all the objects you have in your in your dot git directory and just check is this object still referenced no i'll delete it when will an object uh, stop being referenced so for instance when you do a git add and then reset it because you didn't want to add that that file that object will be orphaned nothing will point to that object unless you create a tag so those files those blobs will be removed when you do a git gc and these pack files will be created uh, at that point in time as well. So yeah, that's a, a very neat optimization you will have by harnessing the power of Git. And uh, finally, I'm not sure how much time I have left, but anyway, I will go up to the point I can. I will go over uh, some high-level commands, and uh, I will try to show you how it maps to each of the of the data structures here. So uh, starting by git diff, when you git diff, you just basically get two references. Uh, you unpack all those objects. Uh, so for instance, you get one branch and one commit, for instance. So you are diffing the point in time uh, pointed to that by that branch with the, the point in time pointed to by that commit, or two branches, or whatever you want, actually. So git will unpack all those references regenerate all the directory structure and just diff file by file. So it will basically show you the diffing of those. Uh, by default, if you just run a git diff, it will run your current status with all the changes you have done, your working directory, with the unpacking of the reference you have in the head. The file we, uh, we talked before about the last branch you committed, you checked out or the last commit you checked out. So it will unpack that, and it will compare it with your working directory just by diffing, the normal diffing. After that, we have the git reset hard. If you haven't ever heard about it, git, re, git uh, reset hard just takes uh, your current branch, and it moves the tag because we showed the branch is only one, one tag, one reference, it will move it to wherever you point it to. So if you do a git reset hard uh, master, it will move your current branch to master, and that will be all. Well, it will actually unpack whatever is in master because you are moving, you are actually moving and checking out to, to that uh, point in time, but all there is to it is uh, moving the pointer. And uh, you will lose when, when you do a, the reset hard, you will lose all your current changes in the working directory. So not only the changes in the current directory, but the changes from the branch you are uh, now moving to, to the branch you are in now in before running this, all those changes uh, in the middle, they will be ignored and removed. As opposed to that, we have the reset soft. This is the default reset. If you, you don't need to write the dash dash soft, it's just git reset. It will um, basically move again the pointer to the branch you have told him to, or moving the, the branch to the commit you have pointed to. And it will diff the origin and the destination and let you those changes as an uncommitted changes. So you can, I don't know, I usually, for instance, when I use this, is because I did a lot of WIP commits because I was working on that and at the end of the day I just committed whatever I had. And after all that development cycle, I said, this repo is a mess, this branch is a mess. Okay, I will go back by keeping all the changes and I will redo the commits in manageable bits. Or for instance, when you have, God forbid it, a really, really big code review and your code review tool 
doesn't allow you to because, oh, actually, you're trying to get inside 10,000 files and we are uh, limited to 700. So you can go back and say, OK, I will commit this 700 by 700 and just one code review for each, for instance. That's not a very common use case, and I hope you don't have to do that any uh, anytime, but that could be a use for that. <laughs> uh, yeah, check out. When you check out a branch, well, the first thing it will do is writing your reference into the, into the head, which makes sense because that's what the head is, and then it will unpack the, the object, so it will uh, the reference by the branch, what commit is pointed to by the branch name, from that commit it will take the, the top level tree, it will recreate the object, go inside all the, the subtrees and do it again and again and again uh, recursively until you have the whole uh, repo again. Merge. Merge is a, a, the first interesting command because we have two cases here. For the first one, uh, well, I'll skip that. Well, no, not really. Uh, for the for the git uh, uh, merge, what uh, git will effectively do at the at first will be to calculate the first common commit between the two branches, the one you are trying to merge and the one you are trying to merge into. It will calculate the the co most common ancestor, and there's where the two cases are. First one is you are trying to merge a branch that came out from the branch you are trying to pull it, uh, to merge it into. So the, actually, the uh, most common ancestor is the commit you are in right now. So that's the first case here uh, in which you are trying to, met, to merge test into master. I have a, a typo here, sorry about that. The green commit is this one and the head is, is here, but for the rest of it, it's, it's good. Um, so what Git will effectively do is, okay, what's the common ancestor between this one and this one? Okay, it's this one. So what should I do? Just move the tag and you have committed it. You have merged it, sorry. Uh, this behavior is called the fast forwarding and that can be avoided. Why I say that? Because uh, in some projects, in some uh, companies, you prefer to keep traceability on when did you merge and what changes were introduced there. If you do this, you are just introducing uh, n commits here, which you don't know when uh, that, that feature started, when did it end, it's just there, like if you committed straight into master. Uh, you can avoid this uh, behavior, as I said, and create a merge commit here by uh, running the git uh, merge with no ff. So that will avoid the, the fast forwarding uh, behavior. And it will behave like the second one. So we have commit uh, at the tip of one branch, which I will call commit A, and we are trying to merge it into branch commit B. So uh, the most common ancestor is not B, but another uh, arbitrary com uh, commit called C, which is basically this, uh, this um, status here. Uh, once again, sorry about that, but the green ones and the, mas uh, the head should be in, in the master branch, which is a shame, but yeah. So what Git will effectively do in this, in this case is just basically creating a whole new commit, which is called uh, a merge commit. And this is actually the reason why uh, the structure that Git uses for the top level commit referencing is not a tree, but a graph because the commit that gets created has two parents. Both commits, the one you are merging and the one you are merging into, are both effectively parents from the commit you are creating, the merge commit. So uh, this commit here is, um, uh, is making it not be a tree because you are merging leaves and that's not allowed. So this makes, uh, uh, yeah, uh, get uh, an a graph of trees, not a tree of trees. After that, I'll move into the cherry pick, which I talked about it before, but I didn't actually explain how, how, that, how it behaved, I just referenced it. Uh, Git cherry pick will effectively uh, get all the, the diff between the commit you're trying to pull and the previous one, and just apply, try to apply that, that diff on the branch you are into, on the commit you are right now, on your working directory. If that works, 
and there's no merge conflict, you are good to go, the commit is created, the committer is uh, updated, the author is not, the merge, uh, sorry, the, the commit me message will be kept the same, so all, uh, all that changes is the, well, the parent, because now the parent is a, a different one, and uh, the committer. So it's that case. We have this commit here, and we want to pull it here. So, bam, it's pulled. It didn't have any merge conflicts. By the way, I forgot to mention, uh, in the index file I was talking about before, the one with no uh, reliable documentation on what the structure is, whenever you have a git conflict, when you merge, you rebase, or you cherry pick, uh, a flag is added there to, so that Git knows you are in a merge conflict right now. That's one of the thousands of things uh, Git does with the index. After that, we will move to another interesting com uh, command and uh, one related to, the, to merge, kinda, and it's the rebase. And sometimes there's a confusion on when to use a rebase, when to use a merge. Uh, I think that boils down in the end to your own preference, your own choice, and the choices of your company, and how much traceability you want to get, and lots of things. But what it effectively does, what, what the behavior is, so that you can relate to that after this, is basically it starts the same as a merge. It calculates which is the most common ancestor. In this case, it's this one. And then when you try to rebase this branch onto this one, it will just calculate the diff between the first two commits and then try to apply here. That goes well, that's perfect, we will continue. If that doesn't go well, you will have a merge conflict here, you will have to fix it, and then it will continue. What will do it after? Calculate the diff between these two and add it after that one. So that's why when you rebase a branch and you have a merge conflict in the first applying of a, of a diff, you will probably get the same conflict or more bizarre conflicts as you move forward and you continue applying more and more and more commits after that. And the ending result will be here. These are the two commits we have rebased. The branch is, is kept the same, but on top of the other one. And these two commits I gave a kind of grayish uh, color. Uh, those are uh, left unreferenced. There's nothing pointing there. Well, maybe at first the origin counterpart for that branch, but after you push, uh, forcing the push, these two will be kept unreferenced. So the next time you do a git garbage collector, the, those will be, will be removed. And uh, yeah, as for uses, uh, uses of rebase, I would uh, suggest uh, w once you have finished writing coding a feature, you have all your tests passing, you have, you are 100% certain that the feature is working, but in the meanwhile, someone has finished his own feature or a bug fix or whatever. I usually prefer to rebase my, my branch first, check that the tests are still passing, that no one, no one broke anything in between, and only after that, I will just merge into the, into the actual branch master, and I will probably do it with no FF to, so that I don't, keep, don't lose uh, traceability on that. But uh, just, that's just my way of using it. Not, uh, it's not set in stone, and everyone has his own opinion and likings. So that's just an, an opinion there. And uh, I have some more, which I will skip because I don't have, I think, much time left, and I would like for some questions to be asked. So I will just go briefly over this one. You can actually do that. This is a valid git commit, uh, command. And this will be done by take, taking a look at the logs for that branch. So when you try to check at a point in time in, in, in git, in, sorry, in a branch, it will go to the logs for that branch and check what was the status of that branch one week before or there are several uh, instructions you can give it there. And it will actually check out to that point in time. So if something broke, I don't know, yeah, one month ago, you can go to that point in time when it broke and you can see what happened there. 
which is kind of cool. And uh, I think I'll go into the questions now because, yeah, no much time left. So thank you for listening, and I hope I didn't bore you too much this early in the day. Yeah, sure. Well, did you use garbage collector? Uh, the fixes are applied to the remote or just the local version? Uh, so uh, the fixes are, are uh, applied into your local directory. So the fact that you are running garbage collector doesn't mean you want your peers to, or your peers want your garbage collection to be applied to them. Maybe one uh, blob you don't have a reference, they actually did a, a tag on that, on that blob. So you don't want those changes usually to be propagated. I think there's a way to, to push those, those changes as well, but I'm not sure uh, what the command was for that. But I, I'm sure you, you can push that to the remote. Sorry, uh, the question was uh, if the changes you are getting by running the garbage collector uh, are applied to the remote or only the local uh, development directory. Sorry. Sorry, the question was if the logs are stored in remote or local. Uh, come on. I will go faster, sorry. Well, actually, I, I can use any of these. OK, so if you see there, inside the logs directory, you have the remote uh, subdirectory. So yeah, effectively, you will have here the logs for all your uh, remote branches. Mm -hmm. How do you solve the SAUH1 issue? <laughs> it depends. <laughs> so uh, usually, you can, for instance, if the merge conf it depends. So if the conflict was when you created a blob, you can add a space at the end of it, at the end of the file, and just commit it again, and it will be fixed. There are more tricky cases, like uh, if a tree, uh, sorry, if a commit conflicts with another commit, or if a tree conflicts with another tree, that's a bit more tricky. For instance, for fixing trees, you can add uh, an empty file again. And so th there are only tricks to, to fix those. There's not a given proce procedure. You have to identify what the case you are in. And actually, in the, in the link I provided, uh, you have cool uh, ways to, to, to identify in which case you are in because of the way it failed. So that can be an option. But yeah, you have to figure your way out. <laughs> yeah? So the question is, if you are using a continuous integration uh, tool and your commit is marked as uh, green because all the tests passed, uh, what would happen if you rebase and it is kept as green, but it is not no longer green? So uh, one of the contents of the, of the commit object is the reference to the parent commit. So once you rebase, the parent changes. So the whole commit is replicated, you have two commits. The one that was marked as green with the same reference it had, but the new one with a different reference. So the CI should be able to identify this is a different commit, and actually it is no longer valid because in the point in time you are now, when you have applied it on top of that, it is making some tests fail or whatever, so it is no longer uh, green. So it's good that it marks as red, and that's done because of the, of the commit hash. Uh, it doesn't mark the merge as red. Mm. So uh, the question was, what if uh, when you merge, uh, the, the continuous integration doesn't mark the new commit as, as, as uh, red and it is kept as, as green? So uh, it depends. If you had your branch uh, with a, a merge with a fast forward, it's because it was already at the tip of the, of the branch you are merging into. So it should, be, it should still be green because the, the status of the repository is exactly the same. In the case in which you are merging with non-fast forward because it was at another point in time, uh, well, the merge commit will have a different signature again because it's 
it has two parents and the, the hash of the content of the blob, uh, sorry, of the, of the Git object is different. So uh, it should be able to identify that it is read because of the same of the, of the commit signature. But anyway, if you want to avoid that case, uh, by all means, just rebase first and then, and then merge. Don't pollute the parent branch. Uh, if you didn't push the, the uh, changes to the remote, I guess you should be able to, to fetch those changes again. Uh, in local, uh, I think when you garbage collect, you garbage collect. It's, it's yeah, we are all grown ups. We <laughs> 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 and yeah, so if you ever want to contact me, not only about Git, but yeah, whatever you want, uh, that's my Twitter handle. And uh, well, you have the, the slides available at the talk description. I just updated it, so you will have uh, a link to this. So well, thank you very much. Thank you.